Excuse me, Trap. Salem's Lot is directed by the legendary director Toby Hooper, who we just lost about a couple days ago at the age of 74. To start off with, I would like to discuss Toby Hooper as a director and what an effect he had on me as a kid. As a kid, when I was growing up, my dad would subject me to a lot of horror films, and one of the horror films that he would subject me to as a child was his film Poltergeist. And at least I never watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre when I was a kid, because I would be scarred for life. But nowadays, I can look back on it and say, yeah, it's a good movie. But Poltergeist was a different case, because it made me afraid of closets. Like, afraid of closets when I was a kid. So I was afraid to actually go into my closet, because that's usually a safe place to go to. And because I saw the movie... It made me scared of closets for about a couple weeks, and then I realized, oh, it's just a movie. But Toby Hooper as a director is a very fascinating one at that. He started off with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and then he had Poltergeist, and a bunch of other different movies. And he's a very, very iconic horror director, and probably one of the leading pantheon of, of contemporary horror film makers. And he sits right on top with directors like Wes Craven and John Carpenter, and for that, I want to say thank you, Toby Hooper, for bringing to life some of cinema's most iconic films and television shows. You were a very, very competent director, and you have always been in the minds of those who loved your films as much as anyone else. So, And with that, I'd like to dedicate this review of Salem's Lot to you. Posthumously, you know, like... You're not alive, so I can't really <laughs> send it to you personally, but if the family of Toby Hooper is watching this, I would like them to know that he has had a kind of a kind of a small effect on my life as as a filmmaker, and I would like to thank him for the films that he's made. But getting back on track, Salem's Lot tells a story about a writer who moves to Salem's Lot, Maine, where he discovers that there's a mansion on a hill that has a bit of a secret. Inside of it is a vampire no, not those vampires. Yes, that kind of vampire. The vampire in this show kind of reminds me a little bit of Nosferatu. The way it stands, the way it moves, even to the way the face looks. It almost looks very similar to Nosferatu in a way. And that's its biggest strength is that a lot of the visual type stuff that it does in the show is actually kind of memorable. There's a lot of iconic shots in this miniseries that is kind of nice. And this is something that I have noticed with a lot of the Stephen King month reviews that I have done so far, is that pretty much most of my reviews for this month have been consistent with a lot of the tropes of Stephen King. And one such trope is a writer character. Now, either he's a supporting character, or he's a character that we are following. And so I'd like to give you a list of all the different characters or all the different movies that have had writers so far. And I'm pretty sure that it's most of them. So I have them all written down here. So we have Bill Denbro from It, Johnny Depp's character from Secret Window, which we will get to later. Uh, James Kahn's character from Misery, the main character from Salem's Lot. Will Wheaton's character in Stand By Me. Uh, Jack Torrance in The Shining, and John Cusack's character in 1408. It's a lot of writer characters for an author, and I guess that's one of his sort of motifs, is that he f likes to focus on writers. It's just like me and wanting to make a film about filmmakers. It's just kind of kind of something that, that he does. It's a little, little kind of quirk, a little bit of a trope that he does, but that's, that's beside the, besides the point. I was just making an observation. So yeah, this film has been passed around as being one of Stephen King's greatest, but I have one particular problem with this movie. Actually, two, actually. I have two problems with this movie. One is in its presentation. Now you're thinking to yourself, Nick, what do you mean by presentation? Is it in a good pre presented movie? Well, yeah, visually and distinctly, yeah, it's very distinct. 
But the problem is, is that in presentation, it's on film form. And what I mean by that is that Salem's Lot is, today, it's packaged as a full film. And the problem is, is that every so often throughout the movie, it'll fade to black and then fade in, as if it's a commercial break. As if it's like the space between a commercial break. Uh, commercial break. Because originally, this show was presented as a TV miniseries. And that's the biggest problem, is that if this was presented as multiple different episodes, I wouldn't be complaining as much about some of the other things I'm going to be talking about. But because it's presented as, as a movie, I have to argue for it as a movie. I can't defend it as a miniseries. If it was presented to me on disc form as a miniseries, where it has multiple episodes, I'd be all fine for it. But the problem is, is that it's presented as a full movie. So I have to judge it as a movie. So going forward, if you think I'm judging it wrong, make sure to comment down below, you know, what you what you honestly think of Salem Slot, because there is some problems I find with this film. And the first problem is is that its pacing is very inconsistent. And that goes back to the to the idea of different episodes. There are certain things in television where you have certain episodes that are a bit slower than other episodes. And you can tell in this movie, there are certain sections of this movie where it feels slower than the other sections. And that's due to the fact, again, that it was presented as a TV miniseries. So you have all these different, different episodes that are just edited together, and it has a very inconsistent pacing. The other problem is that there is very ineffectual side plots in this story where if you were to edit them out, it probably wouldn't be very consequential at all. Like, there's a sub subplot about this driver who has to deliver something, he has these two guys send for it. I mean, that part could stay. But once he gets home, he finds his wife cheating with some other guy, or at least trying to cheat with some other guy, and... You know, that subplot just doesn't need to be in there. It could just be edited out, and you probably would have would not have noticed anything. It's very inconsequential. And that leads me to another point in this movie, is that it's very long. With all the fade-outs and subplots that are in there, it totals in at about three, and a half, uh, three hours and ten minutes. Where if you were to cut some of the si subplots and cut down the sort of fade-to-blacks and fade-ins... You could easily cut this film by like 20 minutes and make it 2 hours and 50 minutes. Does that help it? I probably think it would. It probably helped the pacing just a bit, but I don't fully fully know if that would actually work. If this was to be remade, it'd probably get the same treatment as something like Twilight, where... I mean, I don't want it to be remade as, as if it was Twilight... I'd want it to be remade as if it was an actual vampire movie, where you have a writer that goes into town, and he explores this mansion, and he talks about the mansion, and, he, and he's writing about the mansion, you know? And you get to see the vampire stuff. Because when the vampire stuff actually happens, that's when it's most interesting. But when you have all these other subplots that kind of detract from the movie, it makes the viewing experience a little bit jaded. I have, again, I <laughs> I don't really know how to fully judge this film because, again, it goes back to film versus miniseries. If it was presented as a miniseries on the disc that I watched it, or at least the videotapes that I watched it, then yeah, I probably would not be discussing it as a film, and I would probably give it a little bit more marks, but... Here, it's presented as a movie, and you probably could cut some stuff down for it. So in the end, is Salem's Lot a good Stephen King adaptation? Well, pro possibly. Again, I haven't read the book for Salem's Lot, so I can't really judge it as an adaptation. But I can judge it as a film. And as a film, it's very inconsistent with what it is. And, and that's mostly due to the home video release... And if it was later presented as a miniseries, I probably would be a little bit more lenient to Salem's Lot. But as a film, it's not very substantial. There's some genuinely creepy stuff about this, and it's thanks to Toby Hooper and his work on Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist that really help 
this film go along a little bit more. But we don't get a lot of the scares till like the second act and the third act of the film. And the first act is just so slow. But in the end, Salem's Lot is kind of enjoyable if you can actually manage to stay up and be awake for it. I'm going to give Salem's Lot a C-. minus. It's definitely not a Stephen King classic as I would assume, but it's watchable at least. Thank you guys so much for watching my review of Salem's Lot, and I hope to continue Stephen King month. I have about three, three or four reviews left until um, until Stephen King's It comes out in a couple weeks. So, yeah, be on the lookout for those videos, and I'll see you guys in the next review. Peace.